dollars. Fresh from the lesson on note taking, you're now ready to give it another go with here our second civics lesson. We are continuing to unpack what civics is. We gave a general definition of civics last time. Now we're going to talk about civics as political science, as a field of academic inquiry. Often, when people hear the label political science, they react with puzzlement and sometimes hostility. For example, a couple years ago in Congress, uh, there was a panel on climate change, and this guy, uh, Congressman Massey of Kentucky, a climate change skeptic, was attacking the credentials of a witness who was talking about the need to do something about climate change. Uh, he was ridiculing the fact that the guy had a degree in political science, which he called a pseudoscience. That is a false science, a fake science. How can people who like study and talk about politics call themselves scientists? Where do they get off? Well, the first thing to point out is that the idea of political science is not new. The gentleman at right doffing his cap is Woodrow Wilson, the guy who was president of the United States 100 years ago. He was a political scientist. I'm sorry, he was a political scientist. Um, and he started his career as a political scientist in the previous century. So political, scienti political science as a field of inquiry is more than a century old. We will soon see considerably more than a century old. So political science is a social science. It is the social science that studies governments and political behavior specifically. Later on, we'll look at examples of other social sciences, but uh, political science is, is this one, the one that focuses primarily on governments and by political behavior we mean um, how, you know, who votes, uh, who do they vote for, why do they vote for, um, what about people who don't vote, or um, you know, why don't they vote, um, what about people who can't vote, why are they excluded from voting, does voting matter, um, does, uh, does this uh, ritual translate into action? Does it affect how the government works? These are some of the things that political scientists study. Basically, uh, what governments do, how they do it, why they do it, and to what degree uh, people are uh, you know, benefiting from, suffering from, participating in that process. Now, let's break down that concept of social science. Right, because it's not just political scientists who are calling themselves social scientists. Historians and other social scientists are claiming the scientific label. So um, let's look at what it means to be a social scientist. That adjective social just means having to do with people. Right, so social scientists are scientists who study people as opposed to natural scientists who study primarily nature. Now, here is a definition of science. Probably a definition that you haven't seen before, but it is a complete and correct definition of science. Science is a body of knowledge, right? It's a collection of stuff that we know. That body of knowledge is built by systematic study using empiricist epistemology. Now, this is one of those definitions that contains words we do not know, but don't worry. In the next couple slides, we're going to unpack this definition so thoroughly that it's going to be a, an effective working definition of the concept of science. Here we go. Let's start with systematic. That's pretty easy. To study something systematically is to do it carefully, in an organized fashion, thoroughly. No stone left unturned. <laughs> unturned. <laughs> now... Epistemology. Epistemology is, I, I wish there were a better word for it because it's awfully fancy. Um, say epistemology to like 99% of the people in the country and they will not know what you're talking about. But um, here we go. Epistemology is philosophy of knowledge. More, uh, more simply, epistemology is how do you know what you think you know? Right? We walk around every day with 
you know, a bunch of you know, thoughts in our head that we interpret as factual knowledge. How did that factual knowledge get there? Is it reliable? How do you know? That's epistemology. Now, that word philosophy is also a word that you hear, but uh, often people struggle with the definition. Philosophy is the study of wisdom. What is wisdom? What is the meaning of life? How do we know? And a person who practices philosophy is a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. We are all philosophers, whether we like it or not. We all recognize some things as wise and reject other things as unwise, and it is worth taking time to figure out how we arrived at those conclusions. Now, this is Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher, one of the greatest of the ancient Greek philosophers. He was both a natural scientist and a political scientist. He was a great collector of knowledge and wisdom in his day, was very systematic in his collection of scientific facts, and also systematic as a social scientist. He regarded politics, political science, as the highest science, the most important science. So the concept of politics as a science, as you can see, is 2,400 years old. All right, so now we're cooking. Uh, science is a body of knowledge built by systematic study using empiricist epistemology. The last thing we don't know is what on earth is empiricist? Well, empiricists believe that sensation is the most reliable source of information. If I can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, feel it, I can believe that it's real. If I can't detect it using my senses, I question its existence, right? Empiric, empiricists want proof. So empirical evidence, that is evidence that empiricists respect, empirical evidence is detectable, right? You can sense it. And not just you, other people can sense it too. And that evidence is quantifiable. You know, how many people? How much liquid? What is the temperature? Now, there are also considerations of evidence quality. Subjective evidence is something that only you can see or hear. But if other people see and hear it too, then we're getting toward objectivity. Because if lots of different people can agree that, um, you know, that this, this thing is real, we all see it, then um, we're approaching objective reality. Evidence from amateurs can be useful, that is, untrained people, but Evidence produced by experts, people who have devoted years of study, they've become specialists in the field, evidence from them is, of course, more respected. Vague claims are not very useful. Specific claims, testable claims, falsifiable claims, that's what we want, that, you know, that's when we know that we're doing science, when we're evaluating specific falsifiable claims versus vague um, general ideas. Uh, another criterion of evidence quality that I, I didn't put in the bullet, but is important, is primary versus secondary. Primary meaning firsthand, we have a witness who was there themselves, they personally saw or heard whatever happened, as opposed to secondary, that is secondhand witnesses, like, oh yeah, I wasn't there, but my friend said this is what went down. Right? We know that that's less reliable. It's the game of telephone where the message degrades with each transmission. So you might be thinking, dude, this whole like empirical epistemology thing, that seems super obvious, right? I mean, um, like what other way would people have to know things other than like using their eyes and ears? Well, in fact, it is relatively recent in human history 
that empiricist epistemology became the dominant paradigm. For example, Aristotle, his teacher, was a guy named Plato, and Plato was uh, also a great ancient Greek philosopher, um, regarded as as great, if not greater than Aristotle, and he rejected empiricism. Plato was a rationalist. He believed that our senses deceive us, that our, that pure human reason, the world of ideas, that's the real thing. Don't be fooled by this imperfect reality, these shadows um, of, of what's true. Um, and you might be thinking, well, that's super whack. I mean, how is anyone going to uh, dig on that stuff? But indeed, Plato was influential, though not dominant. Oh, there's... There's Plato. For most of pre-modern history, right, modern history begins around 1500. So when we talk about the pre-modern world, we're talking about the world uh, more than 500 years ago. And more than 500 years ago, religious epistemology dom was dominant. That is, things were true if the local religion taught that they were true. And the way to get to truth was to listen to religious leaders. Uh, this is a depiction of uh, an example of religious epistemology. This is the angel Gabriel dictating the Quran, the holy book of Islam, sequel to the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian Bible, to the prophet Muhammad. Now, Muslims believe this happened. Non-Muslims don't believe this happened. I mean, everyone agrees that there's this book called the Quran that that uh, was that came from this guy named Muhammad. The question is whether the angel Gabriel came down from heaven and dictated it to Muhammad. Um, the point is that you know Muslims believe in Islam. That's a religious epistemology. Christians believe in Christianity. Religious epistemology. Jews believe in Judaism, religious epistemology, Buddhists and Buddhism, etc., right? And religious epistemology could be valid for religious questions. But the study of politics, uh, the study of people, the study of nature, maybe religious epistemology isn't the best way to do that. Now, history is full of irony, so this... Um, Muslim civilization of the Middle Ages actually really grooved on um, Aristotle, right? Uh, medieval, Christian medieval Europe really liked Plato. So they were uh, digging not just religious epistemology, but also rationalist epistemology. Meanwhile, medieval Muslim civilization, while they had a religious epistemology, they were doing some really good science. This comes to Europe in the form of a movement called the Renaissance. Renaissance is uh, medieval Europe's rediscovery of its classical heritage, ancient Greek and Roman learning, including the philosophy of Aristotle, Aristotle's philosophy of science and political science. So Aristotle making a comeback.